So what's better than two carriers? Three carriers. And by time it's in and done here, we will add another BGP carrier to the mix and adjust our routing policies accordingly. I had such a great plan around all of this. I grabbed my GoPro and was driving into the data center. I was doing like a Blair Witch style thing and it ended up just totally not working at all because not only was it too dark, I started you know going back and forth and it was just shadowy. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a videographer, but as soon as I walked in the data center with my GoPro, he was like, yeah, you can't use that here. And I was like, but training. And I was, I was you know doing my best and he was like no no so so anyway GoPro Adventure didn't happen, but the configuration did. Now, total time, I wanna make sure that you uh, grasp, total time to get this configured with Iron Mountain on the phone was about two and a half hours. They had a great technician assigned to this. He did a great job. Uh, and then there was about two hours of follow-up, just clean up, communication, and so on and so forth. So overall, this was about a five hour, I'll say configuration, which might be surprising when you look and you go, oh, there's only a few lines of config. Config is always the easy part. It's the communication, the scheduling, the follow-up, the cleanup, the monitoring, blah, 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 blah. That's where the time comes in. All right, I wanna start off with looking at the ticket from Iron Mountain. And I wanna point out that I opened this about a month ago. That's why earlier in the uh, BGP series, I said, hey, prepare about a month for this because all the coordination and communication with carriers just takes time. So sent over the LOA, they sent their LOA back, and then they started scheduling sending a PDF showing here's what we're gonna configure on our side. And I wanna fast forward all the way back up to here. And I've, I've blurred out some of the names just because I didn't ask their permission to throw their name out there. So, so uh, you can see exactly just what we need to see. So you can see that uh, you know, th this is now five days ago when I was actually in the lobby getting set up. You know, let's do this, we got on the phone. First thing I wanna point out is that we converted from HSRP to BGP. Here's what that means. I'm drawing this right here as two routers connected to a single router because who knows what their configuration looks like. But in reality, IO Data, or now Iron Mountain, actually has two routers that are connecting down to my two routers, something like that. And they were set up for HSRP. That means we have a master and a standby that's there in case something bad were to happen. Now, it looks like these are two separate lines, but they're actually crossed. There's a, there's a nice switch in the middle so that they can have communication between them, allowing the standbys to verify that the master is online. Well, that configuration is not compatible with how they did BGP there. So what they did was instead of having a single slash 29 subnet, which provided eight IP addresses, one here, one here, one virtual, one here, one here, one virtual. So six that are actually used between them. They decimated that, which actually I didn't see coming, and converted it to two slash 30s. The reason I emphasize I didn't see that coming is because that's what caused a lot more of the time. I go, ah, okay, that's going to cause an outage. So what we tried to do was keep one of these active on the slash 29 while I set up BGP on a little slash 30 over here. And it actually worked mostly. There was a couple precarious moments where I was like, ah, what's happening? And we caused a, a few packet drops where we were jumping back and forth because of some duplicate IP addresses we had. But in the end, that's what the conversion from HSRP to BGP accomplished. Now, let me take you to the routers themselves and show you what they look like. And I hope you've seen the earlier nuggets before we added this third carrier so you can have a compare and contrast. But I'm going to start off with a show IP BGP summary. You can see that I'm on uh, Brocade 1, which is actually a connection to CenturyLink, a backup connection to Cogent. You can see that one's stuck in the connecting state, and it's never going to connect because Cogent isn't actually plugged in here. But now I have this third uh, connection to Autonomous System 12025, which is IOData that is now established. Notice as well that I have not just one network sent, but five networks sent. What? How did that happen? I don't know if you remember, but earlier in the series, I said we have a whole bunch of misfit subnets that we got from IO data from back in the day, some slash 27, slash 28, just, just some public subnets that we had as we grew before we got the big BGP subnet from CenturyLink now become level three. Well, everything before BGP was in place was all set up from the carrier's perspective as static routes coming over to us. And that's something else I found out this evening is when they set up BGP, they don't do any statics whatsoever. So even the misfit subnets, along with the slash 24 block that we're using for BGP, are all set up for BGP to and from my routers. Now, before I show you the configuration, let me quickly emphasize that doesn't mean that these slash 28s and 27s are able to be advertised out. Those 
carriers. They're not because they're too small. Those carriers would filter them out. Remember I said that you need a slash 24 or larger subnet to be able to advertise that across multiple carriers. This just means that we're using BGP to advertise it out IO blend and that at least makes it redundant between the two routers, essentially doing the role that HSRP filled before. So bringing you back to the router, you can see there's my connection to IO data. We're only receiving the default route. That's the same thing as it is from CenturyLink. But if I do a show IP BGP neighbor and I zone in on that one neighbor and I say show the advertised routes, I want to see what I am sending to them. You can see not only that class C subnet from CenturyLink, but all of the little misfit subnets that I was talking about that we've been assigned from IO data over the years. Now you might wonder, well, why is the next hop on some of these subnets, you know, a specific IP address, whereas others are blank or this 255 local? Well, that's going back to how I had to advertise these. Now, to remind you, these two routers are just handling BGP. They interface with a whole bunch of other routers behind it that represent our resources or our customers' resources for people that are sharing our rack space. So what we do is we take those larger subnets, whether they be the misfit subnets or the large level three subnet that came in and break them up into smaller subnets as we send them this direction. However, when we advertise those via BGP, we need to send them, them being the other carriers, the original subnet that we were assigned. We can't, we can't send them all these little subnets. So oftentimes what I will do is create a route to null zero. For example, if I go onto my router and do a show run, let's do a pipe include IP route, and I'll just do another pipe null zero to filter just the null zero routes. <laughs> Whoops, that was an or command. Well, you get the point. Down here at the very bottom, these are all the individual routes that I've created to null zero. And when I do the redistribute static, those are the ones that I've set up the filter for to allow into BGP. Let's just zone in on this one right here. That's the specific class C subnet. Now you might think, well, if you create that route to null zero, isn't that discard? Won't that start discarding all the traffic for those? No, not at all. Remember the number one rule of routing is that the most specific match wins. If you look up and avert your eyes a little higher in the screen, you can see here's all the little subnets that we've broken it into. We've said this subnet of 63, 232, 144, you know, .96 with this, this subnet mask, this block goes to this customer which is a router sitting behind there that ends up using a whole bunch of these addresses. So when a packet comes in for something that goes here, it'll match that it's the more specific route and it forwards to its correct destination. The only ones that actually match this route are the ones that we haven't assigned yet to our customers. And those should be discarded. So let me show you the configuration, the full configuration for Iron Mountain. I'm going to do a show run. Let's do a pipe include router BGP and let's do a pipe uh, neighbor and I'll just paste that neighbor in there. 72, 44, 246, 173. Hit the enter key. So here's all the neighbor configuration that I put in place. Now, I wanna mention that originally I had a password typed in. We had agreed on this before we actually did the configuration, but the session would not come up. And when we did debugs, both me and the Iron Mountain engineer saw that authentication fa failures were occurring. On their side, they had Cisco devices running iOS XR. On my side, Brocade. For whatever reason, the BGP authentication was not compatible between them and we ended up removing it altogether. I've seen that happen before, it's weird. MD5 should be MD5, but apparently it's not. Notice, first command that we typed in, configure the remote autonomous system. I threw a little description on there so I can uniquely recognize what that neighbor is. I tuned the, t the timers and that's the same as all the other. I also enabled soft reconfiguration inbound. That's a feature that actually remembers all the routes that the carrier sent you and puts them in a table that's untouched on the side. So if you ever need to do some, some tuning of your filters for inbound routes, you can do that without resetting the neighbor session. Now I wouldn't recommend that if you're getting the full BGP table, unless you have a lot of memory, because it does keep a whole BGP routing table untouched in a separate area of memory. Now right below that, you can see that I attached a prefix list to that neighbor saying BGP filter IM outbound. I created another prefix list. Let me show you. Do a show IP prefix list. Whereas before I just had one BGP filter that I worked great to send the network to cogent and level three because it was just the class C. 
But once I found out that we had to advertise all the Misfit subnets to them as well, when peering with Iron Mountain, I had to create a prefix list that identified all those Misfit subnets and allowed those to pass through as well. <laughs> you can see from my sequence numbering, there was a couple that we missed. Now the last change that I made, and this is really relevant, you want to see this, is I removed all policy routing whatsoever. Now that's a change from the original plan. You might remember the original plan was once I was able to advertise the 63 network, 63 232 network, out all of these different carriers, I was planning on allowing that default route that they all sent me to handle the majority of the routing. So I would just let default routing do its thing and all the traffic would just naturally route using whatever load balancing it would need across the multiple carriers. Then I would create a specific policy routing configuration that allowed it to identify those misfit subnets and just send them out IO data since these guys wouldn't know about them. Well, here's what I found out. Level three and Cogent had no problem accepting those misfit subnets, which is awesome. I don't have to create any weird complex policy routing to send all those tiny misfit subnets just out IO data. I can let them all follow the 0000 outbound across any of these carriers and it doesn't matter that they weren't assigned to us. They don't have any filter that prevents them. And it works just fine. Woohoo! Totally simplifies the configuration. Totally gives us perfect equal load balancing across all these carriers, even though I don't have BGP routing those misfit subnets to these guys. Now, it will still only come in from IO Blend. You following me here? I know my screen's getting a little messy. They'll only come in because that's the only place that's advertising them out to the rest of the world via BGP. And I guarantee you, they're summarizing those routes. They don't send those tiny routes out to everybody. So it's not like I'm fully redundant. Like if IO blend goes down, then I can get those misfit subnets this way. That won't happen. Inbound is not resilient, but outbound is. That's really cool. That was super exciting to me. So let me do a show IP BGP because this is one more thing that I want to show you. I'm now receiving two default routes, one from CenturyLink, the other from Iron Mountain right here. Now by default, BGP will always choose only one of them to go from the BGP table into the routing table. So many key points to talk about. And I wanna make sure you guys remember that inside of the router, you have your BGP table, which is all the routes that the, the router receives from the carrier. And it looks at that table to figure out the best of those routes that goes into the routing table. So when you do a show IP BGP and you see everything inside of that BGP table, it's a lot of routes, but only the best of those will get to the routing table and there can be only one. Even if everything's equal on those routes, BGP will force the decision to only choose one of them unless you go under BGP. Actually, I'll show it to you right now and type in the command maximum paths X. I put two in my case because I want to say you can load balance up to two routes that overrules the BGP algorithm to say you must choose one and allows it to install two of those routes into the routing table. So even though it's identified one of these is best, this maximum paths command allows me to do a show IP route and see that two of them have been passed over to the routing table, you can see, by BGP. It took me a while when I configured this to remember that command, because I was thinking, why is only one route showing up? Now, if I wouldn't have typed that command, I would still get the resiliency because if one of the links fail and the first default route is removed from the VGP table, then it will say, okay, the, the second one is the only one left. Let me pass that into the routing table and it would have failed over, but I wouldn't get what I do now and that's load balancing. Isn't this great? I'm gonna go over to BroKT2 just to show you, do a show IP BGP summary. I'm not gonna show you all the thing because it really is just a duplicated state. On this router, I have the cogent routes and connection up and running along with the Iron Mountain. We've now added the third carrier to the mix, removed all the policy routing, and added the maximum path so that we can load balance over all those connections. <laughs>